All right, lesson one. The plant subject is ahimsa. Himsa means violence, ahimsa means non violence. It's a little bit interesting. When you ask people what is yoga, they will say it's an exercise or meditation or both, exercise and meditation. Especially modern yoga is very physically oriented and people consider it uh, exercise. But the first thing you learn in yoga is not exercise, not asana. It's yama and niyama, the ten moral principles that form the foundation of yoga. The question then arises, why? Why don't we start with exercise and meditation, energy control maybe? That is because a lot of the instability, inf the, 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 the fluctuation between tamas and rajas, or the lack of sattva, is caused subconsciously by breaking universal laws. The yamas and the niyamas, we call them moral principles and precepts. They're not designed to be holier than Tao or holier than the Pope, which some people think. It is to find more peace in our lives by being aware of what causes disruption of the peace of the sattva. And the first of those of the five yamas, the five yamas, five niyamas, the first one is non-violence, and it's also the most consequential one, and the one that we break most without being aware of it. When you think of violence, you think about people punching each other, um, screaming at each other, maybe is also considered verbal violence. And of course, they are forms of violence, but they are also the most easily recognizable forms of violence. So that's not so difficult to deal with. And if it is correct, you have been raised and educated at home and in school to try to uh, solve conflict without physical violence or without verbal uh, violence. So most people are relatively in control of those forms of violence, although not always. Uh, but what is much more important here is the subtle forms of violence that we do not recognize as, as such. And you find them in uh, subtle ways that we deal with people um, we can hurt people without screaming at them, by being cynical, for example, by saying hurtful things that when confronted with it, you will say, oh, no, I, I didn't have any bad meaning with that, or, or you know, which comes to the next uh, uh, yama of uh, truthfulness, of course. <laughs> but if you understand the yamas a little bit, and both of you do because you did the course before, you, you know that, that these kind of things happen all the time every minute of the day. And it happens because it's a, it's, these are subconscious processes that we are not aware of. So we just act and react in instinctive ways, verbally and also physically. Why is this important? Because violence begets violence. If you shout at people, they will attack you back. If you physically attack people, they will physically attack you back. Ending in an endless cycle of violence. He who lives by the sword, dies by the sword.
So as long as we continue uh, acting in violent ways, and violent is a big word, but I'm talking about the subtle forms of violence that we do not actually recognize as violence, we will find more violence in our lives. And this is important because it disturbs our sattva. And when you start out on the path of yoga, the main issue in yoga, and you find that on every page, and you find that in every exercise that you learn, in asana, in meditation, in pranayama, the goal is always sattva. Every philosophical aspect that you learn in yoga is designed to give you insight how to preserve sattva and what disturbs it. And it's almost all related to subconscious thought processes. Subconscious thought processes that become more and more conscious in the yoga practitioner. Because when you discuss the subject, people naturally, often also subconsciously, they start reflecting on it while going home on the subway, while in, in, during the week, the, the six days until the next class, very naturally the dots start to connect, you start to recognize it within yourself and in the environment around you. And that is where the control starts and that is where life becomes more peaceful. Now, <clears throat> having introduced nonviolence as the first moral principle of yoga, that brings us to asana. At the workshop, I showed what asana is like, because modern yoga classes is all movement just like an aerobic class or uh, CrossFit or um, an exercise always good. I keep saying this, exercise is good for everybody. But yoga is not movement. It's standing still. Asana literally means standing still posture. But then teachers who are not properly initiated when they teach traditional yoga, which these days they call Hatha Yoga or Yin Yoga or Healing Yoga. If you go to a studio where they have all the moving yogas, in the schedule here and there are what is close to traditional yoga, asana, properly. They call it Healing Yoga, Yin Yoga or, um, uh, what did I say before, uh, Hatha Yoga. But then they put you into a pose and then they say, relax. Now when you relax, tamas occurs. The secret of asana is that you stand still without movement, but that you actively engage in the pose. So when you do a tree pose, you're actively stretching up. Your leg is straight, you're not hanging in your hip joint or something. You're balancing, your leg is straight, and you stretch up, you actively stretch up. You're not resting and relaxing in the pose. You're standing still, yes, but you're also engaging. Standing still is tamas. Actively engaging is rajas. Et voila, there you have the secret. It's so simple that most people <laughs> don't believe it. But sattva starts immediately. It's why I fell in love with yoga without knowing anything about yoga the very first time that I experienced proper yoga. It felt so good and it took me 20 years or more to understand why I felt so good. It's because it caused sattva. It caused sattva in a very uh, uh, tumultuous body and mind. And that day that I experienced that, I immediately went and was told that it, this is actually yoga. I immediately went to the library. Internet didn't exist at that time yet. I went to the library, I went to the Y section and I got a yoga book. I started practicing yoga every evening before going to sleep. And it completely changed my life. 
Transformation, that is what, that is what yoga do, does if it is done properly. If you keep moving, which is health, good for health and what have you, that transformation does not take place. That's why I stick to this approach. That's why I don't give in to teaching modern yoga, moving yoga, just to please people because that is what they like to do. I know what yoga is worth and that is why I want to spread it to those who are interested. Other people can go to another class and do the movement thing. So non-violence start in your asana. If you find it a little bit difficult at first to recognize it within yourself and in society, then start practically applying non-violence in your posture. If you feel pain, it's violence. That means you have to stop doing the exercise or reduce the intensity, how strongly you engage in the pose. If you go too far, it will cause pain. This also means that violence can be from very subtle to very severe. And it's the subtle forms that we do not recognize. But when you are in asana, standing still, in silence, no music, and no teacher who is constantly talking to you, distracting you, you become more and more aware of the subtle forms of violence. And it starts in your asana. You feel a little cramp that you otherwise would ignore. You feel uh, sh a little shaking or you start to feel that your mind becomes restless when you stay in a pose too long because you're looking at the clock and you say to yourself, I have to stay in this pose for one minute because that's what is prescribed. But after 30 seconds, your body is actually done, but you look at the clock and you say, I have to stay. Then you cause rajas, disruption. Now you close your eyes, you feel as long as the asana is working, the, the, the benefit from your asana. But then comes the moment, not looking at the clock, but feeling, looking inside you, comes the moment that you start to feel the disruption. Something starts stirring in you that says, I don't want to do this anymore. It causes a little bit of restlessness, a little bit of discomfort. That is exactly the moment when you should stop. I almost use the word allowed, you're allowed to stop. Because we are so conditioned to look at the clock and have the discipline, and we even grind our teeth, and we say stupid things like no pain, no gain, etc. No, not in yoga. Maybe in the gym, maybe in CrossFit, aerobic, or in the sports field, but not, not in yoga. Because in yoga, that's considered a form of violence that leads to disruption that keeps you from <coughs> developing a sattva condition. Which leads, sattva is so important because only with sattva all those wonderful transformations occur, insights come to you. Most of my students, in just five months that we do this course, they completely transform during that time, because they develop a whole new vision of themselves and the world that they are living in. And it's all in the crown chakra. All it needed was a little bit of energy being uh, stimulated to rise up to that level of consciousness. It's incredibly powerful. It's also, it's very easy to achieve if you stick to what yoga prescribed. And it's, it's, in fact, it's so easy that people just don't believe it. So, ahimsa, nonviolence, starts with consciousness, being conscious of your violent actions and, and the reaction that it invites from the environment, from the people who the violence is, is directed at. And it then comes the next step where you decide or where you refuse, basically, to go along with the violence. So again, life throws 
circumstances at you, you will find yourself in life uh, uh, in certain circumstances. Violence is triggered in you. From now on you are aware of that and you simply refuse to go along with it. That is mastership. You take control and you go on your way still in peace. While in the past you would have been influenced by the circumstances, it would have led to an altercation and it ruined the rest of your day. Now, on page two, towards the bottom, you see in bold characters that there are three levels of violence in deeds, physical, in words, verbal, and in thoughts. In deeds, everybody understands our actions, if they're violent. In words, that's verbal aggression. But what many people think to be harmless is violence in thought. But violence in thought is just as it may on the surface look subtle, but it's just as influential as verbal and physical violence because people feel your thoughts. So if you have, if you have violence thoughts but you don't express them, people still feel your vibration. And they will still react with violence towards you. And the, other, the opposite is also true. If you can replace nasty thoughts, judgmental thoughts, violent thoughts with positive ones, people feel that vibration too. And they will react in kind. So if you have a feeling that life is presenting you with many nasty people, Start looking at yourself and try to replace your own uh, 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 negative thoughts, violent thoughts, uh, 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 judgmental thoughts with positive ones and you will see that there will be less and less nasty people on your path. That is the law of karma at work. Now, the final subject is practical. It's about haste, being in a hurry. I, I had a situation in Nonyondong uh, where I had classes in 2017 and 2018 where I just arrived at the subject and it's the first class and a student came in late, <laughs> new student came in late and sat down in the back, the, the entrance door was in the back so she came in and sat down and I was just talking about coming late and the consequences of being late, and she thought that I was scolding her. So when the class was finished, I didn't know her name. There was a class with 23 people or so. So I went to her and I asked for her name so that I know who she is and where she is on the list. And she thought that I came to her um, because she was late. And oh my goodness, that, 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 never, that, that, that never repaired. She, because she, she reacted very violently, very, and I was baffled. I, I, I was just, yeah. And I, later I tried to explain, and, and, but that never, she kept coming late and she never enjoyed the class. And for me also it was very difficult to, to have that negative energy sitting in the back of the class. But anyway, the point is, when you're in a hurry, you set yourself up for this disruption, disturbance. So, if you're the least bit sensitive, you actually stop coming late very naturally. That's what I do. If I have an appointment or I have to go somewhere, I always leave home early, too early. And I always arrive at my destination too early. So I can just go there leisurely, not in a hurry. 
whether I walk or take a subway or I don't have to look at my clock all the time and think, uh oh, I'm going to be late. What will they think? And it gives you the time to connect to um, what is the right word here. I, when I arrive at a place where I'm going to meet somebody, I have a little bit of time to look around. The environment, the place, the coffee shop or the restaurant or whatever place it is, they, just look around, have a feel for the place and be ready for the person to come in. So it's very calm, very easy. But if you're in a hurry, if I'm in a hurry because I'm late, I feel guilty, I feel bad. I know that somebody's waiting for me. And that person will not be happy, me coming late. So that already create, it, not, not only does it create negative chemistry between the person you're going to meet and maybe from whom you meet, need something, professionally or personally, but you're in a hurry. You totally destroy your sattva. <laughs> and when, once you get used to sattva, the peace of mind, the calm, that you create through your yoga practice, you don't, you don't want to destroy it if you can avoid it. And one of the things that you can really do, coming late is a habit, one of the things that you can really do yourself is stop coming late, prepare in advance, leave a little bit earlier. I've, I've noticed, and that, that is why I say that, that coming late is a habit, subconscious, <laughs> um, 2000, the end of 2015, we moved to Kangamun. And then 2016, we moved to Yangje. So a lot of movement from Yoido to Kangamun to Yangje. At that time, I noticed that people who come late always come late. It's a choice. Subconscious or not, but it's a choice. What happened? They were always late in Yoido. It was an advanced course, so three semesters. So we moved from Yoido to Kwangamun. And the first time they came to Kwangamun studio, they were in time. And they said, oh, it takes shorter to get here. It's, it's much shorter than going to Yoido. Only the first time they were in time. From the next time, every class they were late. Why? It's a habit. I think especially when you're in, into yoga, it's not a good habit. I also, I don't know how you feel, I'm Dutch. If you have an appointment with Dutch people, they feel bad if you don't arrive in time. They think it's an insult or disrespect if you come late. And if you come late because you had a flat tire or there was an accident that held up the bus or the tram, you know, that. That can happen. But if it's habitual, Dutch people don't really like it. But I know there are also cultures where it is normal to come late, and they will even say, it's not okay to come in time. Why are you so early? But I'm not from that kind of culture, and for me, from the uh, point of view of yoga, uh, coming late is violence, because you become rushed, and if you have a conscience, you feel guilty to the person that's waiting for you. They're waiting for you. So it also becomes theft. You're stealing other people's time and energy. By coming late, they're waiting for you there. They made time for you. They arrived in time and then you show up 10 minutes or half an hour late. So from that, from yoga point of view, these are all causes of disharmony. All right. Now, uh, the third paragraph starts with the sentence, I highlighted it with the highlighter, yellow. It says that violence can be recognized through pain, we, we talked about this, which can be very subtle, which I also mentioned. But this is very important. Because obvious violence, people will recognize. But there are many forms of pain, we're talking about pain, not necessarily violence. There are many forms of pain that are so subtle that we do not recognize them. And 
as a result of not recognizing them, we allow situations to get worse. An example of this is disease. A disease always starts with very subtle indications that something is wrong. Very subtle discomforts, very subtle signs that something is not, not good somewhere in your body. We just steamroll over those subtle signals. We, we fail to see them, we fail to recognize them. So disease is progressive. It starts with very subtle symptoms. If you do not, symptoms or pains are signals. They, they warn you that something needs attention, that something needs taken care of. Because we are so much focused on the external world, we fail to recognize those subtle signals. So the disease will then throw stronger symptoms at you, stronger signals at you. And you, you can see on a scale, on a sliding scale, disease starts with very subtle signals and it ends with death. I'm a little bit dramatic here, but what is important here is that we learn to recognize signals as early as possible. So not when they are already so far in progress or progressed that it leads to very serious consequences, like very serious disease. And The same applies also to, to not only disease, but also to uh, 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 violence in general. Um, in daily life situations, uh, uh, in the same way as with disease, we often just steamroll over subtle signals just because we don't see them, we don't recognize them. And it, it leads to situations that, that escalate into um, um, into conflict, that if we had been sensitive enough, if we had been aware enough of the early warning signs, we could have prevented the conflict from escalating. And that is not only good for relationships, it's also good for maintaining your peace of mind, your sattva. So that, that is why um, ahimsa is important, refusing to go along with uh, 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 violence in all its forms when, when confronted and also to learn to recognize violence, especially the subtler forms. Recognize it and then act upon it. Lots of men are known to not want to go to a doctor. So they develop symptoms, often quite severe, and they just refuse to go to a doctor until it is too late. Don't be like that. I am not like that. If I feel something is wrong, I go to a doctor and have it checked. I don't care what other men do. Just have it checked and taken care of if necessary. All right. Questions? Okay, let's have a short break, then we start with asana.